hopefully we can find Jen um, so she can present her portion of the training today. Um, but first, I wanted to start off by welcoming everyone. Um, your presenter. Devon, I made it. Oh, hi, Jennifer. How are you? Great. Thank you. That's good. Glad you were able to make it. Um, so I was just introducing our training today. Um, your presenters um, will be Jennifer Brown from the um, Crisis Shelter of Lawrence County and Dan Carney um, from the Union Mission, myself from the Lawrence County Community Action Partnership, and Brian Miller um, will be facilitating this training today. Um, so the topic is Western Pennsylvania Coordinated Entry System Training 101, Understanding the Bigger Picture. Um, and the objective um, for the training today, um, really we just want um, for users to gain an overview of the Western PA COC Coordinated Entry System and um, how we're meeting um, the regulations of um, Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, as well as, um, you know, meeting the COC's perspective. So we'll go ahead and get started um, by providing the background of coordinated entry. Um, and really this ruling um, came, again, from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and it requires for Continuum of Cares to establish and operate a coordinated entry process within the regions that they're serving um, in that the recipients of the CSC program and emergency solution grant program funding within the CSC area to meet, um, meet these requirements. And if you're wanting to um, look at this guidance and um, do some research on your own, um, a good um, site to you always go to um, would be HUD Exchange, um, and you can type in 2012 COC program entry rule um, to find this guidance. You can also look at the 2011 Emergency Solutions Grant interim rule, which, ha which has also lists some coordinated entry guidance, and then um, the HUD 2017 coordinated entry notice. And you know what, Brian, that's actually all written on the next slide. Sorry about that. So moving on, what is um, coordinated entry? Um, coordinated entry is defined as a process designed to coordinate program participant intake, assessments, and provision of referrals. And it covers the geographic area um, and should be easily assessed by individuals and families seeking housing and services. Um, the coordinated entry process should be well advertised and it um, also includes a comprehensive standardized assessment tool. Um, and when we say, when we are referring to geographic area within the Western PA um, balance state COC area, um, we are speaking of the areas that are shown on the next slide um, in green and in orange. So these areas that are highlighted in green and Orange covers the Western Pennsylvania, Balance of State, Continuum of Care region. So with that being said, our process, um, our coordinated entry process should be um, conducted universally um, and uniformly um, throughout these regions. Um, that would affect, you know, how we're advertising, our entry processes, um, just to make sure that our clients understand where to access, and we will, um, Dan will be reviewing access um, during his um, portion of the training. Um, but, so we do want to know, like, who is impacted by the regulations of um, these guidelines that HUD has put out there? Um, and. Um, who's being impacted are um, the COC um, region, 
um, COC funded organizations, ESG funded organizations, um, your VA and veteran providers um, are also encouraged to participate with the lo with their local coordinated entry system. Um, domestic violence providers, um, the way that they are operating um, are also impacted. Uh, and then the consum consumers and community stakeholders. Um, so how does coordinated entry regulations impact my programming? Um, COC and ESG programs are required to only serve clients placed on the prioritization list in order of priority. And this prioritization list um, that we are referring to is built into HMIS, um, which a lot of us are familiar with and we have used. Um, and the and what this is is you know we're prioritizing how um, the, the C, we're, our prioritization is based off of the um, with how the COC is prioritizing um, you know their clients. So what we're looking at is you know chronic veterans, families with children, youth, and DV um, are all being prioritized. Um, within our COC, and we're following HUD prioritization rules as well as our COC prioritization rules. We're also following a housing first philosophy, um, and then um, programs can no longer operate on a first come first serve basis. Um, providers are now serving consumers who choose to live in their community um, with no residency requirements. Um, any longer. There are no residency requirements any longer. Um, coordination and collaboration with new partners and new ways. So these are all different ways of how coordinated entry regulations are impacting um, our current programming. Um, so just speaking a little on housing first. Um, Coordinated entry um, philosophy is um, we want is a model of housing assistance that that prioritizes rapid placement and stabilization in permanent housing, but does not have service participation requirements or preconditions for entry. Um, so that would mean sobriety or minimum income thresholds um, in accordance with the COC policies. All COC funded projects. Um, and ESG are required to operate in accordance with a housing first approach. Um, service delivery should be consumer centered and um, culturally competent and to work to connect households with the appropriate permanent housing opportunities. So why does coordinated entry regulations impact um, my programming. Um, coordinated entry process will help communities prioritize housing assistance based on vulnerability and severity of service need to ensure that people who need assistance the most can receive it in a timely manner. Um, systems will provide information about service needs um, and gaps to help communities, um, our COC, um, plan where their assistance is going to go to um, and identify um, the resources that are needed. So these are two of the main reasons um, why um, and how coordinated entry regulations are impacting our programming. So moving forward with this training, we are going to just um, review seven components uh, which make up an effective coordinated entry system and um, these seven components um, are helping you know the coordinated entry committee um, to develop um, this process um, for the CSC. Um, so if we scroll down two slides, um, 
this slide really just reviews who is involved in the planning process um, of coordinated entry um, up to this point in time. And if you would like to um, look at each of these roles, like a breakout of each of these roles um, within our policies and procedures, um, they, you, they can be found on page 13 and 15 page 13 through 15 of the approved coordinated entry policies and procedures. Um, I do want to mention um, where it lists designated assessment centers. Those um, centers would include the general assessment center that is assigned to each area and the d domestic violence assessment center that has been de designated in, in each community. And then this slide here um, just highlights um, the process, um, the planning process, and what have what has been accomplished up to this point in time. Um, it also um, lets us know where we're at. Um, so uh, you know the board's de designation of the coordinated entry system committee and chairperson. Um, and then the designation of the coordinated entry lead agency, designation of the coordinated entry um, assessment administrator and developer, which is DCED, um, and then the development of coordinated entry systems with pilot counties. Um, then step five was hiring of the coordinated entry staff person, um, and then the development of the CE policies and procedures. And I'd say right now, um, as far as the phases go, we are in phase seven, eight, nine, and ten. Um, we're really um, flying this plane as we're driving it, um, but the training and system implementation, development of communications and tools, development of universal adver advertisement, um, we're all, you know, things that we're coordinating currently and putting out to you. So the next few slides that we're going to um, be training you on is just the process of how to stay current um, with all the changes um, that are occurring um, daily with coordinated entry. Um, so, so to stay current with all of the changes. Um, you could visit the Western PA COC webpage, and the link to that webpage is listed there for you. Um, you can, on this page, you can check out the COC event calendar, um, which will list you know, court, some of the coordinated entry events that are occurring. Um, you can also view recorded training webinars on this webpage. Um, you can review the COC coordinated entry system policies and procedures um, along with their attachments. Um, so we should, um, Brian, can we click on that link? Um, this one? <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Yep. And we'll go to the Western coordinated entry webpage. the top of the page, you can see where it says Western PA COC, if we were to select that option and then choose coordinated entry, it will take us to the page that is currently showing on the screen. Um, and if we scroll all, all the way down, you'll be able to find a lot of the documents coordinated entry related um, here under documents and resources. And then the next tab under documented resources will provide you with the training, the recorded training, the PAHMIS recorded trainings, and then the coordinated entry monthly training um, as well are being recorded. 
the meeting minutes from the coordinated entry committee are also being listed um, at the bottom of the page. Um, so, oops, sorry, yeah. Um, so also, um, some, another way to stay current with um, coordinated entry happenings, um, if, or if you have questions or you would like to submit feedback, um, there was a job form that was created. Yes, go ahead and select that. And the link is provided there and will be sent out um, the recording training, rec the training recording. Um, this link right here will allow you to submit all of your questions related to um, the coordinating entry process. Um, and it's pretty easy to um, funnel through. Um, you'll just type in your first and last name and you'll um, provide your email address, phone number, and then your agency information, and then what role um, best describes um, what your um, question is related to. Um, so for instance, um, I am a domestic violence um, provider and I have a question related to um, a DV policy. So I would go on ahead and select Domestic Violence Assessment Center and then select Next. And then up at the top there, the next question is my feedback question is related to, and then you would select um, a topic um, that your question or feedback is related to, and then you can select a subgroup um, there. And really what this is allowing, what, what, what's happening here is we are collecting um, information and bringing it back to the coordinated entry committee so that they can you know what our needs are um, you know for this process you know what needs work on what's what's happening that's happening well um, you know if there's something that um, needs more clarification you know this you know this is all a good venue um, to submit the information to if you have a success story that you'd like to share if you would like to request um, advertisement materials, training, et cetera, all your requests will be funneled through this form. And then you would just um, finish by completing the rest of the questions. Um, yep. And then if you'd like to upload a document um, at the end of the form, you're able to. Um, do so as well. And then hit submit. That document would then um, get sent to um, myself and a few other um, team members here at LCAP. Um, and then we would direct um, the questions to the appropriate COC staff. Um, or coordinated entry subcommittees um, from there. Another way to another way to stay current um, and connected with the coordinated entry process is to get connected to the workplace uh, by Facebook. Um, and I believe if you email Brandon um, at br. E-A-U-M-A-N at PA.gov, um, you should be able to um, get connected to the workplace by Facebook. But we have been um, putting a lot of our communication uh, and utilizing this social media platform as well. If you have not yet done so, um, please go ahead and subscribe and watch for coordinated entry notices from Lawrence County Community Action Partnership. Um, you may want to check your spam or your junk folder. Um, if you have not yet 
seen communication from this um, media platform. And the logo here is over to the side. And these, uh, when we send communication out, it's more or less going to be about um, training opportunities that are occurring. Um, if the committee, the coordinated entry committee, um, would like to send information out um, to the uh, coordinated entry community, um, assessment centers, um, partners, et cetera. Um, and then also, in, we are encouraging everyone to attend the coordinated entry monthly training classes, which are uh, reoccurring every third Thursday of each month. And then if you have not yet done so, um, schedule DSP with myself, um, and you can email me at jclark at lcap.org. Or, oh, or you can actually send it through to the job form if you'd like to request the DSP. So how to get involved. Um, if you're wanting to get involved with the coordinating entry committee, um, because we are currently seeking, they are currently seeking members, um, two, they're, they're asking two voting members from each county, um, and there will be numerous non-voting members. Um, selection should be finalized and approved by your local LHOT or housing coalition group. The chairperson of your LHOT or housing coalition may provide names and contact information to Javon Clark um, or Debbie Hennon, and the email addresses are listed there. Also, how to get involved, um, just by submitting questions and feedback through to the JOT form, that's one way. Again, it will help the COC identify our future growth areas of the system um, by communicating needs and by sharing success stories through the JOT form. And then one huge piece um, to the planning process is um, advertising. Um, the CSC must affirmatively market coordinated entry. Um, so we're using this and we're, we're currently planning um, how our flyers and brochures are going to be implemented throughout the CSC. Um, so there is a marketing survey um, which has been created um, and will be disseminated again along with um, the recorded training. Um, that's taking place today. Um, so we're asking that um, members of the assessment center, coordinated entry partners, if you have a moment to um, participate with that survey so we can um, collect data on what the best marketing strategy would be for each community. So uh, I'm going to talk about access, and I know that um, a lot of people have probably seen this slide if you've Googled coordinated entry or have been talking about it in your community. It's a slide that really helps to try to represent how people have been searching for housing uh, in the past, which was very scattered on the left side and, and very independent process, and coordinated entry uh, being a, a system that helps to streamline that process. And you know, so often when I talk to people about coordinated entry, we get a lot of questions about, you know, how do I get somebody onto the list, or am I supposed to be using this this thing to fill my bed? And and so certainly those are part of coordinated entry, uh, but we, we have to look at coordinated entry, as uh, Jay Vaughn pointed out, as a, as a systems change. It really is a, a call to action in our community to create deeper and more meaningful collaboration across agencies. And it does change and affect, you know, who and how households access the system and so on. And so as we begin to dive into these deeper uh, topics related to coordinated entry, I just think it's uh, better to think of it in a broad uh, area that we're talking about systems change. And so I like to look at coordinated entry a little bit differently. Um, and this conceptual map kind of helps me to look at it. 
And if you take time to read all this, you'll see that you know, the component pieces that we're talking about today are represented here in this picture. And we have this kind of roadmap, uh, if you will, as a reference point that allows us to uh, draw an inference and, and explain the process of coordinated entry. And my responsibility today right now is to talk about access, which you can see is represented down here in the lower left corner by the wooden sign. And when you think of access, you know, the, the point of access is how do we get the people onto this freeway so that either they're headed for the diversion uh, prevention ramp or they're headed towards being assessed, prioritized, accessing shelters and waiting for a housing intervention so that ultimately they can be permanently housed. And so what is access as it relates to coordinated entry? It's really simply how people connect to the system. You know, how do we in our communities make sure there's resources known? How do we connect the people to the resources? And it's important to note that in your communities, every assessment center uh, serves as an access point, but they shouldn't be the only access points in the community. Again, this is a systems issue, and we have a lot of important players who can contribute and partner in these local communities to make this system responsive and robust. And so who should these partners be? Um, I like to think that in each community we need to be engaging with any partner who works with any household or person that's housing insecure. Uh, there's some examples listed here. Certainly this is not an exhaustive list. You know, if in your community you have a, a small diner that has a, an inexpensive breakfast that you know people are, are going to or a coffee shop or even a Walmart can potentially serve uh, as an access point to direct people towards coordinate entry. Uh, an opportunity to uh, engage those folks to make sure that those households are certainly being able to be assessed and, and provided opportunities. Uh, so how do we engage these allies in our community to be a part of the access uh, process to coordinated entry? Uh, we'll have some future training on what makes a good access point a great access point, but at the bare minimum, uh, an access point should be able to conduct the pre-screening and uh, know the referral, the appropriate referral to an assessment center in your community if it's warranted. Um, the the pre-screening process was devised to be simple to use, easy to remember. We wanted to have it so that as many partners as possible could be part of this pre-screening, and we're not asking them to increase their workload or to learn something new. It's a very simple uh, kind of thing. And so we're gonna review these questions, uh, but we will go into them a little bit deeper uh, in a June uh, CE training, explaining the reasoning behind the questions and what information from HUD's perspective we're really trying to get at. But we wanted to keep with today's theme of just keeping this broad. And so the pre-screening questions are, are you literally homeless? Are you at risk of becoming homeless? Or is anyone in your home making you feel unsafe or afraid? Something that we would hope everybody can memorize and use when they're going out in the community to talk and, and gather allies to access. Uh, two important things happen with these questions. Uh, if they are homeless, imminently at risk, or fleeing a domestic violence situation, they're gonna be referred then to the appropriate assessment center in your community. And also, if not by the access point, then certainly by the assessment center, uh, they're going to be connected to uh, and referred to mainstream resources and any of the emergency housing interventions that that household might need. So it's not just about assessment, it's that next uh, layer that we're gonna talk about today. There's a couple of things to uh, keep in mind as it relates to access. Uh, Jay Vaughn talked earlier, the process has to be uniform, which is why we developed the three questions so that across our 20 counties, we're able to have access, feel, look, and, and be the same. Uh, emergency services such as shelters operate independent of coordinated entry. Uh, this is not to say that they're not part of the system. They're certainly vital to that world of homeless uh, intervention and continuum of care strategy, but the access to these services is not dependent on having the assessment or the utilization of the priority list. Um, and access must have safeguards with uh, those folks that might have a lethality or safety risk. So. We talk about domestic violence assessment centers. Uh, each county uh, has those to, to be part of that process for offering those additional safeguards. 
And we'll also have future training for all partners on domestic violence and understanding the additional precautions, concerns, and general safety guidelines we should all be following uh, when working with this vulnerable population. Uh, diversion and prevention are a very, uh, an underlying very important part of ACTA and the coordinated entry system overall. Uh, we'll discuss these in more detail in the June training, uh, but they are such male pieces that the continuum's offering a two-day diversion training on June 11th and 12th. Uh, the Cleveland Mediation Center trainers uh, are experts in this uh, conflict resolution approach, and they're coming in. Uh, they've been doing training since 2014 on diversion, and so if you've not already received information uh, via email, please reach out to Javon so she can forward it to you so you can attend that training. And I'll leave you on this. You know, once a household's been identified as needing referred for assessment based on those pre-screening questions, uh, they're connected to the appropriate assessment center in the community. And Jennifer Brown from the Crisis Shelter of Lawrence County is going to talk a little bit more about the uh, assessment process. Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Brown from the Crisis Shelter of Lawrence County. I apologize for my tardiness. I was having uh, technological difficulties, um, but I did want to talk with you a little bit about assessment. And because this is a 101 training, I wanted to keep it relatively simple and just kind of go through some of the questions that we had when we started this process. We didn't even know what client track was or what coordinated entry was, and it's, it can be very overwhelming to people who are starting it or to people who are have a lot of other obligations in their lives other than um, doing the homeless assessment. So the first question is talks about where you complete this assessment. We started out with a paper copy, uh, but we have moved completely online. So now the assessment is on uh, client track and it is on uh, the homeless management information system. And one of the things that HUD really emphasizes to us is they really want the client to be present when you do the assessment for a couple reasons. Um, but importantly, because we are trying to be client centered, we want them to be part of that process as opposed to sort of a giver and a taker of information. So when they're, they're present and you're doing the, um, the intake, they're able to see what types of information you're gathering and they can offer clarifications if necessary. So HUD has really emphasized to us that they really want us to be doing um, these assessments with the client present and not on paper. And typically, um, the people that complete the assessment are trained intake staff members. And I believe Javon talked a little bit about this in the beginning. Um, there's a multitude of ways to find out information, and if you're interested in some basic trainings, um, you can go on the website that Javon listed earlier in the slides, and we have lots of recorded trainings uh, that, that we all attended at the beginning when we were learning about this process. Um, the handbook's also a very valuable tool as well. And it's important to, to sort of reiterate, there's basically three places where people are going to go for the intake, but we do operate under that sort of no no wrong door um, kind of policy because we want to get away from that uh, visual that we saw earlier where it's, you know, the housing process is kind of chaotic. So we want the idea that we're not continually sending people from one place to the next place to the next place and, and they're getting frustrated and they're not getting housed. So the idea is that we do have a general assessment center, which is the primary location, domestic violence assessment center for people that are fleeing violence and then auxiliary agencies in each county who are uh, providers who are able to do the assessment as well. But we're trying to focus on the idea that we're not sending people who need housing from place to place to place, and we're trying to get them as housing as quickly as possible. Um, typically, an assessment takes about 20 to 40 minutes, and this just depends on the individual, and it depends on, um, you know, the information that you're collecting from them. But I would say that overall, I've never done an assessment myself that takes more than an hour. Um, and some are, are relatively quick and others are in the middle. And the assessment covers about 12 areas. I've listed some of them on the screen, but essentially we're looking at 
you know, this person's life and, and what are the, the components or the aspects of their life that have impacted their ability to, you know, find and maintain housing. And these are some of the issues that we look at. And then we're going to talk about how this assessment turns in the numbers. So you complete this assessment with the client sitting with you and you will end up with a score. And this is automatically, um, will be automatically done within the computer. And what we base that score on are two things. One thing we call vulnerabilities. And when we talk about vulnerabilities, we're talking about things that people um, have that oftentimes make it difficult for them to maintain housing. And these are things like having a uh, domestic violence issue. These are uh, drug and alcohol background. This is um, you know, being homeless for long periods of time. And so we assign point values. And by we, I mean um, the coordinated, the um, continuum of care and the coordinated entry subcommittee has worked together to assess what these vulnerabilities would be. In addition to the vulnerabilities, we also have um, HUD priorities, and this changes uh, usually at least annually. And HUD right now is prioritizing families, they're prioritizing youth, they're prioritizing veterans. So when you, you, the points are assigned to those particular subpopulations with those particular qualities, then that person's able to receive a score, and that puts them higher on the list. And so when housing providers are looking for people to fill housing, they're, they're looking at the top of the list, and that's where you're going to find the individuals that have been the homeless longest, who have um, vulnerabilities that we have scored the highest and the ones that are um, scored high on HUD's priority list as well. And I just want to mention that this list is a living list, which means is it changes. Every time someone is added to that list, the list adjusts. So unlike a housing authority list where you're sort of waiting to get to the top, this list is ever changing to serve the people that have the most vulnerabilities. So oftentimes people that are searching for housing, they don't understand that concept. And as providers, it's very important that we explain to them that this isn't a list where they're placed on it with a number. This is a list that, that changes. So even though they may be high on the list today, that doesn't mean that they're going to be high on the list tomorrow. And that's a difficult concept for people to understand. And that's an important piece of the, the training uh, as far as providers are concerned. And we use this assessment not, um, not to make things difficult for everyone, but to make housing more accessible and to bring some uniformity to housing provided, um, housing provision to people that are in need of housing. And most importantly, we're trying to eliminate barriers to housing and we're trying to eliminate practices that screen people out. And this is hard because we are trying to house the hardest uh, populations to house and it's a challenge and it, it takes a lot of um, it takes a lot of skill and a lot of ability to sort of work with these populations to make sure that we're getting them housing and that we're able for them to maintain that housing. And that's really what we're trying to do with coordinated entry. So just a few pointers um, when you are doing assessments. Remember that this is about client choice. So the guiding principle is it's what the client wants. And we are trying to eliminate barriers to housing. So we are not allowed to consider things like income or criminal background or poor credit or substance abuse when we're determining whether this person is going to receive housing. With that said, um, I do want to point out two things. Eligibility and entry requires proper documentation. So if you're saying an individual is chronically homeless, then that needs to be documented. If you're saying an individual has a disability and the housing program requires a disability, then that needs to be documented. So when you're doing the assessments, it's important to remind um, the individuals that are seeking housing that they are going to have to eventually be able to document the information that, that they are providing to you. And also, um, program requirements can limit the applicant pool. So what I mean by that is, for our program here in our domestic violence shelter, we don't have to take anyone into our trans transitional housing program that is not domestic violence, because that is a program requirement. So if you have program requirements that relate to domestic violence or age or um, anything that has, has to do with an individual, 
that is program specific, then you don't have to take anyone other than the types of persons that your program serves. Um, also, again, it's client's choice. So clients have the right to refuse to answer certain questions or to limit the information that they provide. And this does not mean that they don't get service. This does not mean that they don't get entered onto the list. And importantly, clients also have the right to refuse housing offers and they remain on the list. So it's important to remember that this is client-centered care and we're going with client's choice. And as Javon mentioned earlier, we are operating under a housing first model, which connects nicely with the idea of eliminating barriers to housing. So what we're saying is we want to get people into the housing first, then we will address the issues that need to be addressed. So, um, just keep in mind those concepts of housing first, client-centered care, but that does not mean that uh, programs have to accept people who do not meet their qualifications or that clients uh, do not have to provide documentation. So it's a balancing of that sort of client-centered care and the ability to meet program requirements. Um, we are also, the training is very focused on the idea of data protection and protecting confidentiality. We are looking to you know, collect only enough information to provide services. We are not looking to collect entire histories of individuals. We're just looking to get what we need to be able to provide individuals the services. And I also wanted to emphasize that safety planning is not just for domestic violence or other individuals who are in danger. Safety planning is for everyone. Um, we all know that individuals that have all of these types of vulnerabilities are also vulnerable to violence. Um, homeless individuals are vulnerable to violence as well and to be taken advantage of, as is, you know, elderly populations, veterans, um, youth. So it's important that people receive training on safety planning. So if you have um, caseworkers who are doing assessments and intakes, it's important that they receive some types of training on safety planning, especially if people are living on the street until they can get into housing. It's important that we come up with ideas and ways to try to keep people safe if they are on the streets or couch hopping. And uh, the next thing is prioritization. And prioritization simply means that the people that have more vulnerabilities and longer time homeless, they're gonna get higher scores, which means they're gonna get access to housing more quickly than others. And the vulnerabilities are the barriers. So do these individuals have health issues or criminal record or do they lack an income? And the, the vulnerabilities, um, HUD sets priorities. Uh, these are usually done on an annual basis. Um, the continuum of care also sets priorities. We have prioritized things that we believe make individuals vulnerable when they do not have housing. Um, both, the, both HUD and the COC board have both indicated that they're going to reevaluate these priorities, at least annually. So we need feedback from the people that are actually using uh, the assessments and using the list. And the JOT form that Javon was talking about is an excellent way to give us feedback. Um, what's working? What's not working? What uh, populations are you seeing that are vulnerable that perhaps we should be reconsidering when we're looking at scoring? So we are looking at, at figuring out, you know, are, do we have the vulnerabilities that we want, you know, to go to the top of the list or are there other populations of individuals that perhaps should be um, receiving points? So those are issues that we want to hear about. We want to know uh, what's going on in your actual use and practice with the list. And as soon as you put a person on that list, they're on it. It happens in real time. So they could be contacted um, from a housing provider as you know, almost immediately because we're looking to get individuals onto this list within 24 hours and we're looking to get contact to them as soon as possible. So our goal is for people not to remain homeless. Our goal is to get people into housing as quickly as possible. So how do you manage this list? Yes, everyone is in charge of updating their list. So if you are entering um, clients into the list, you need to update them. You need to update them if their information changes. Uh, have they added an individual to their household? Have they got a job and they now have income? Has the disability status changed? Has their homelessness status changed? Um, so anytime information changes, that client needs to be updated. And even if there isn't a change, you need to be updating the list every five to seven days. 
Um, the feeling behind this, again, is we're trying to get people into housing as quickly as possible. And updating means you are contacting that client or you are finding out what's going on with them. What's their status? What's their progress with housing? And that's what you're updating. Um, sometimes the update is not that anything's changed, but you're just checking in with that client to see what the progress is. And then you can indicate that in your update. So you wanna check in, you wanna see what's happening with them. Um, do they need any assistance? So this is basic case management that you're gonna reflect in the case notes on the client track. And how do you know if your client uh, has a housing offer? For general assessment centers, um, the housing provider is going to change a client's status to in processing and they'll include a case note. And so you'll be able to check that to determine whether your client has received housing offers and where they're at in the process. For domestic violence assessment centers, a housing provider will contact the case manager, and this is usually done by phone or email. The names of domestic violence victims are not included on the list. What is included is a reference number. And so the domestic violence case manager has that reference number, which is why the housing provider contacts them directly. And then that case manager sort of works as a middle person to uh, get the two connected. And this is done um, for safety reasons. And how do you know if your client has actually received housing? Again, basic case management. You need to you know, do the follow-up contact. You need to read the case notes and client track. And then also there's reports and client track that you're able to access to see what has occurred. And I believe that Dan Carney is going to talk with you about referrals. Uh, referral is that uh, next piece of the now what questions, you know, so we're going through this process and explaining it and if someone was referred to coordinated entry, they're assessed, they're placed on the priority list, and so now what happens? And uh, so referral covers that section uh, of the next steps. And it's an important piece of how our households uh, get connected to housing services using that priority list to fill their openings. It's important to uh, qualify that, you know, if we haven't alluded to it or said it enough yet, uh, this system's change is gonna take time to reach its potential. And so I'm gonna focus mostly on where we are now in regards to the system. Uh, the June uh, training will uh, take us one step further and highlight some of the possible future referral scenarios, but we really just wanted to stay focused on uh, the bigger picture and what's happening now. Um, so housing programs using coordinated entry uh, fill their opening, using it to fill their openings, um, receive their referrals uh, from the system, uh, meaning that they go to the priority list when they have an opening and they search based on who fits their program, uh, whether that's a single family, you know, a household, male, female, et cetera. And uh, that has indicated also that, that they would live in the location of that program. Uh, these programs uh, attempt to reach that household via phone call, text, or email, or through the assessment center staff who conducted the uh, household assessment and placed them on the list. And I highlighted here uh, that, you know, we have to be mindful and make sure that the stakeholders in our community uh, that are part of this system are also aware of this timeline that, you know, when we're reaching out to households to fill those beds, that we have to hear back uh, and from those folks uh, so that we can engage with them and begin uh, doing uh, the, the collection of paperwork and verification of homelessness history and disability and so forth and get them into housing. We don't want them to lose uh, that opportunity to engage, engage in a housing solution because we couldn't reach them. Uh, once they're engaged, the accepting program works with them to collect that documentation to verify eligibility. And uh, super important to note that referral does not immediately equate with admission. So coordinated entry doesn't override an agency's admission or intake process as uh, Jennifer discussed earlier. Um, it does, however, strive uh, to have programs using the housing first uh, modality with little to no barriers for uh, admission. Um, the admission process is monitored. Uh, by coordinated entry governance to ensure that programs aren't excluding households or skipping them. And so that way we can make sure that, again, those folks with the highest acuity in our communities are being served first. And it is person-centered. The referral process, the whole process, uh, every section is person-centered. 
And so it's our goal to connect these households to housing where they have an opportunity to succeed and, and remain housed. And so if we force or coerce someone into housing, certainly they probably won't do as well as someone who makes an educated decision and is part of that process. And so that does mean that even through the referral process, households have the right to indicate the type of housing intervention they want. They, they may only want to pursue rapid or permanent supportive uh, housing uh, or some sort of uh, diversion. Uh, they can indicate where they would be willing to receive that support. So part of that process of assessment and putting them on the list includes allowing them to choose which areas they would choose to live in, and they can refuse a referral or entry into a program without jeopardizing uh, their place on the waiting list. And so I think that's an important thing uh, to understand. Um, so it, it also covers some areas I didn't highlight here as it relates to the system as a whole, and these cross over and correlate to the other sections as well. Referral also means connection to mainstream resources or other supports that are needed by that household. And so, you know, we know that changes in need can occur while people are waiting to access housing. So the assessment center staff who are engaging regularly with these uh, households during that period will help to make those referrals. And that way, you know, these households are getting referrals at the front end as part of the access process. While they're waiting, if their needs change or something comes up, they're getting referrals to mainstream resources and other supports. And certainly at the back end, once they're accepted into a new program, that program will make sure that they're connected, especially if they move uh, locations to the resources that they need there. Uh, referral also means connecting to traditional housing or other community housing opportunities that aren't part of the homeless system. And so again, the assessment center staff are working with these households to pursue all options. We know that the demand outweighs the availability, and so some households aren't going to be served with programs that use coordinated entry to fill their openings. And so we want to help uh, connect those households to other opportunities to help them transition out of housing. Um, and as I said, you know, a few times, if it's a systems change, uh, to have an impact and to drive those deep level communications, it's important that coordinated entry includes uh, data management and evaluation. So uh, before I pass the baton to uh, Jay Vaughn, who will wrap things up for us and discuss those components, I just wanted to thank you uh, for myself for your time and attention, but to uh, even more so let you know that even if you're new to this conversation, uh, you're now uh, ordained as an ambassador, congratulations. Uh, to help us share the message of coordinated entry in your community and to engage the appropriate partners to strengthen and grow this system locally. Javon? Thank you, Dan. Um, so, yes, so I'm going to wrap up by speaking about data management and evaluation. It's um, important to note that um, as you're conducting assessments or managing the prioritization list, um, you know, we have to make sure that that data is clean data um, because all of that information that we're putting in coordinated entry um, is being, will be, or is being reported um, to our CSC board as well as um, uh, the Department of um, Housing and Urban Development. So, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, we know how to enter the information and that we're entering the information in uniformly. And there is a committee um, that has developed outside of the coordinated entry committee who's working on planning a face-to-face -face training um, so just to ensure that we all understand how to um, enter the data into the assessment correctly. Um, so watch out um, for more information on that training um, to be coming out um, within the next few months. Um, but we did want to highlight um, today just some trends, some data that coordinated entry is gathering um, to date. Um, CE has the ability to report on um, the types of populations that um, the COC is serving, um, permanent housing placements, um, how many um, we currently, how many consumers we have housed um, within this region, um, temporary shelter placements as well we're able to report on, 
um, the CSC average placement score, which is um, when that consumer is placed on the list, um, they're given a score and the average placement score is, for instance. Um, and then also we're able to report on the average accepted score off the list. So um, I was accepted into um, a programming with this score. Um, so, um, you know, we're able to just pull an average from the entire um, CE information and look at, you know, all of the information that's coming in to find that average. And then um, relocation data is also being collected. Um, and then the average days homeless. Um, this data, again, um, it will assist the CSC with determining um, future funding um, and planning decisions um, in the future. Um, so as far as evaluation, um, you all are, you know, doing a great job up to this current point in time with providing your feedback. Um, you know, if, if you're noticing changes are needed with the system, you're sending that information through um, and it's being looked at and, you know, the system's constantly being tweaked and, you know, we have a really good thing going. So, you know, I feel like that's where we're at as far as evaluating right now. You know, we're really just trying to have a good quality system um, that works for everyone. Um, so, as far as the future growth areas of coordinated entry, um, Dan was mentioning earlier, um, you know, about the, the two-day diversion training um, that the information was released yesterday. Um, you know, we're, we're, we know, hope to get some really good information to come out of that training um, so that we can, um, you know, as the CSC, um, know, you know, know what resources out, are out in our community to be able to um, divert um, consumers from entering the system. Um, you know, again, like Dan mentioned earlier, you know, we're really hoping to develop more coordinated entry ambassadors and mentors. Um, you know, our universal referral line, um, you know, just some other things. And then looking to um, look at the LHOT and the Housing Coalition's involvement even more with coordinated entry. So these are just some future growth areas of coordinated entry. And if anyone's needing um, training um, and technical assistance um, from the CSC level, county level, provider level, or DV specific, if you want to send those requests via the JOT form and, um, you know, your request will be fulfilled. Does anyone have any questions? Um, have questions being submitted through the chat? Brian, I'll throw it to you. Thank you, yeah, everyone. I'm looking at yeah, I'm looking at the chat, and so far we haven't had any questions asked. Um, just to bring it up for for everybody, uh, they should have a, a command bar um, either on the top or the side of your screen that's got some options, and one of them should be a chat. Kind of looks like a bubble. Um, you should be able to click on it, and you can type in questions, and uh, we can. Uh, Answer them if you uh, if anybody has any. 